Succes i veterinær praksis, podcast nummer 114. Søren Tejstrup her. Jeg er dyrlæge, og det er mig, der har startet succes i veterinær praksis. Dagens emne er utrolig relevant, især hvis du, som jeg, arbejder i praksis. Det handler nemlig om, hvordan vi kan få en bedre konsultation, og hvordan vi kan føre en mere effektiv kommunikation med klienterne, eller med ejerne, eller hvad du nu kalder dem, og hvordan at vi i godsøjne kan overtale dem til at tage imod den rette anbefaling, og få dem til at gøre, som vi også anbefaler. Det her projekt med Succes Veterinær Praksis, det er, hvis du er ny, så er det sådan et projekt, der består af den her podcast, du lytter til nu. Den er gratis at abonnere på, og det kan du gøre i en app på din telefon, hvis ikke det er det, du allerede lytter. I øh, Apple iPhones, der er der en app, der bare slet ret hedder podcast, men du kan finde mange andre i App Store. På Android, der hedder de noget andet, og sådan en telefon har jeg ikke, men jeg ved, der er noget, der hedder Pocketcast, som er rigtig populært. Ind i den app, der søger du bare frem efter succes i veterinær praksis, eller søger efter succes i veterinær praksis, så dukker de her podcast op. Og på hjemmesiden på succes i vetpraksis.dk, der har jeg også et gratis nyhedsbrev for dyrlæger og særligt interesserede veterinærsygeplejersker. I det nyhedsbrev, der fokuserer jeg på at levere relevant fagligt indhold og protokoller, tips og tricks og pdf-download, så meget andet godt. Og, den, og det kan du tilmelde dig over på hjemmesiden, som sagt. Jeg vil selvfølgelig på et tidspunkt prøve at sælge dig adgang til det tredje ben i det her projekt. Der er online kurser med nogle specifikke læringsmål. Du kan selvfølgelig bare vælge at overse de e-mails, så hvis ikke du synes, at det er noget for dig, så kan du også melde dig fra igen med et enkelt klik. Så hvis du kun er interesseret i de gratis protokoller og alt det faglige indhold, så kan du meget hurtigt komme ud af det igen. Du tilmelder dig og ser det hele over på hjemmesiden sammen med noterne og links til dagens afsnit. Det alle sammen finder du samlet på s svp.dk-114, der er noterne til dagens afsnit, svp.dk-114. I dagens afsnit har jeg snakket med en af mine online helte. Det er første gang, jeg rent faktisk snakker med ham, men jeg har lyttet til ham og set ham rigtig mange gange, både i hans egen podcast og på YouTube og mange andre steder. Han har en utrolig populær amerikansk hjemmeside. Han hedder Dr. Andy Roark og er en af de mest kendte bloggere i vores branche, så jeg er måske også en lille smule starstruck, at jeg skulle snakke med ham, men det, det kan jo så være for min egen regning. Han han har rigtig meget godt indhold, og han ved, hvad han snakker om, og han er meget dygtig til at kommunikere. Men det vil du opdage om et øjeblik, for nu skal vi over til interviewet med Andy. Hi Andy, and welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm very honored to have you here, and uh, because I know you very well. We haven't actually talked face to face before, but <laughs> but I've been following your online presence for a couple of years now, and I, we actually spent some time together without you actually without you knowing. Well, well that's good. That's good. <laughs> that you know, that's what we that's what we really hope for in social media and in vet practice. I think a lot of people misunderstand what we're trying to do with social media as veterinarians. And it's it's very difficult to educate pet owners online be, uh, because they don't go to social media for education. They go to social media to to relax after at the end of their day and and to see their friends. And so social media, when done well by veterinarians, it is a relationship accelerator. I I love that you feel like you know me. That that's the point. And and as a veterinarian, you know, the you can have the most wonderful examination, and someone brings you their their three year old cat, and and you you have a great time together and very good conversation. And when do you see them again? Well, it's been a year. But if I can if I do social media well and I can move that person to my social media, when they come back, it's not the second time they've seen me; mm-hmm. it's the forty second time they've seen me. You know? Yeah. And um. And 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 when we share ourselves and we share what we enjoy and what we love, they really do feel like they know you. And I am what I say is, you know, with social media, in one year I can move that client relationship to where it used to take me three years to get to. Mm-hmm. And so that that's social media done well. So when you say to me, I feel like I know you because I've seen these things, I don't know that there's higher praise that you can give to me. That that means a lot to me, Soren. Thank you very much for saying that. 
But uh, thank you for also for taking the time out to actually talk to back to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, even though uh, yeah, you don't uh, respond too much when I scream at my iPhone. So <laughs> that's so it's it's nice to, to actually have you. Uh, but I I also think that you are a very skilled communicator, and that also helps in the in the uh, for me to get the message. And you. Um, Uh, I know other people think you're a skilled communicator as well, and you do online courses, and you have uh, a conference, and and uh, you have a lot of uh, things going on. So I'm very, uh, I'm very honored that you you would take the time out to talk to us. Um, and I, I that was uh, the communication part was also what I hope we could dive a little bit into here because uh, maybe we can get some of uh, your knowledge across, and maybe I can pick some <laughs> nuggets out of you and uh, what's in your online course as well. But sure. um, I feel maybe not a lot of people know you here in Denmark on the, in Scandinavian countries because uh, uh, we tend to speak our own languages first and then English second. So yes. um, uh, maybe you could give us a short introduction to who Andy Roark really is. Sure. Um, so, so I'm a veterinarian. I work in... Uh, Greenville, South Carolina, here in in the United States. Um, I do a lot of things on Facebook. So Dr. Andy Rourke on Facebook, uh, we have about a quarter million Facebook followers. And generally, it's mostly veterinarians and uh, vet nurses and front desk staff and managers and things like that. So I do I do a lot of 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 sharing to veterinary audiences. We have a website called it's drandyrourke.com. And it is a it is a website where other people in veterinary medicine write, and they generally write about their experiences and lessons they've learned, things that they've struggled with, and and I publish it on my website and then, and then push it through my social media because it's such a large presence, and it really gives people a platform and a voice to talk about veterinary medicine in a way that doesn't exist otherwise, and we it's it's very unique, and and I, I I'm honored every day that people would choose to send me their thoughts and their writings and things and and allow me to to give them that platform but they do so we have about a million visitors a year uh come to the website to read uh read about veterinary medicine and and those those are sort of the main things that I started out doing online I do a lot of speaking um there's a conference it's the NAVC conference uh here in in Orlando And it's one of the biggest vet conferences in the world. And uh, I, I've been the practice management speaker of the year there three times. I do a lot of a lot of talk about communication, uh, especially with pet owners in the exam room, and then also online. And so those are the types of things I, I tend to talk about and lecture about. Uh, two years ago, I started my own veterinary conference. It's a business development conference, so it's all about running veterinary practices and uh, and sort of growing your career and, and again improving communication. It's called Uncharted. And it's uh, it, again, I, I think it's a very unique conference and approach. I've never, I've never seen another conference like what what we do with Uncharted. Mm -hmm. So those are those are uh, those are some of the things that I do. I have uh, I have a wife who works full time as a as a college professor and a scientist, and uh, two little girls uh, who are the most important thing in the world to me. So those are the the things that I juggle. And you work in a practice as well, right? And you. I, I do. Yes. Um, small animal only. So I'm only a companion animal person. I, uh, I do not have room in my brain for horses and cows and pigs and birds. I, I wish I did, but they just don't fit. <laughs> so Andy, we talked a little bit before we went live here or before I pressed record that the systems in the States are maybe a little bit different one from what we have here in Europe, where uh, you tell me that you have more technicians and more nurses per vet uh, to to do different kind of tasks, where we here in, in Europe, maybe uh, the cost of labor is uh, maybe a little bit higher and, and more of the tasks falls back on us as vets. So there's a bit difference in, in the systems we have. Can you talk a little bit on uh, how we leverage that or maybe how uh, the challenges uh, in that and maybe we can talk about communications from there? Of course, yeah. yes. I would say that having systems, it's a different kind of system, but having systems for the practices where the veterinarians are so central is also important. They're more of an individual 
um, time management system than what we use here in the States where we spread across individuals. And so what I mean by that is if everything is reliant on you as the veterinarian, having checklist systems, um, having reminder systems, having easy access in your practice management software where you can quickly review the case and then also check on the history, the backstory, what the pet is due for, um, and just run through your own system of reminding yourself of the things you need to talk to before you go in. That That's fantastic. And I say that when I started in practice, I, I didn't have a system like that. And, and I worked at a practice where um, we had we had a lot of doctors, so we didn't have a lot of technician support. And so it was much more on on me as an individual doctor. And I was a young doctor as well, so I was not I was not as experienced, but I struggled to, to get everything done that I needed to get done. When I left that practice, I went to a different practice, and uh, they had a much more organized system, m- much better reminders about what this pet was due for, what are the other things that I need to be talking about. And my average client transaction, it went up $40, in, you know, in, in that move from one practice to the other. I mean, on average, I was doing $40 more diagnostics and services at this new practice. And I don't say that in, in the point is to make more money. That, that's not what I'm saying. But it goes to the fact that I, I was I was not talking about these things at the first practice and I was missing them. And, and that's, I think, like I said, I think that a lot of that is experience on my part and becoming more experienced. But Soren, most of it was really having a system that I could go back to just to keep me on track with what am I doing here? What am I trying to accomplish? Where do I want to go with this appointment? And I don't think that many of us think that strategically. We jump in and we address the moment and, you know, and we do our best as we improvise in the conversation. Uh, An ounce of of prevention is worth a pound of cure is an old saying in the States. And there's truth to that. Just having some sort of a guideline and a plan to go in, it makes so much difference. So if we're going to dive into the, <coughs> to the, uh, uh, your online course on better appointments, is that mm. one of the, the points that you like to make that, that we have, a, um, uh, that we have decided beforehand what we're, what we are going to, to talk to the owner about? Absolutely. Yeah. Go, we want to go on with the strategy and here, here's why Soren, I believe that our profession attracts a certain type of person and that person is very problem focused. And we, I think we naturally want to fix problems. That's probably why we were drawn in this path. But then once we went down this path, we were trained again and again, identify the problem, isolate the problem, fix the problem. And that is wonderful when we're dealing with sick pets. When we talk about regular wellness care and the lifetime health of the pre- of the pet, that can be problematic because when the vomiting dog comes into the practice, we laser focus our attention on the vomiting. And if we were able to take a more holistic view, I think we would look and we're more likely to say things like, oh, this pet has never had a fecal examination or has not had a fecal examination in over a year. I wonder if vomiting is associated with a parasite load or this pet has had blood work in the past and had some mild abnormalities. That would be something that we might want to check in this pet Then maybe we wouldn't check in another pet that hadn't had previous abnormalities, but it's those types of things. When we look at the whole context of the pet and the pet's history, Those things present themselves, but often when we walk into the room and we see the vomiting cat or the vomiting dog and our, our focus just tightens down on that problem and we let a lot of the background information go and we miss opportunities to, to find diagnoses, but also to truly address the whole health of the pet. Mm -hmm. So you would, uh, yeah, uh you would actually need to take some time beforehand to look at the records just just to make sure that you don't miss a blood sample that is two years old or uh, anything else important. You do. And the most important part of the system is to make this process time effective. Mm. You know, let's be honest. We do not have a lot of time. Most of us in practice, when, when we get very busy, and I think a lot of the people listening would say, would say, Oh, I, I don't have time to read back through two or three years of history on this bet no. before I walk into this room. 
and I think that there's, I think that we should be honest about the time constraints we're all under a good system pulls that information out or displays it to us in a way that's easy for us to see and get the pieces that we need in a very time effective manner. Hmm. So you would, yeah, you would need a, a, a system, a, a, a computer system to, to manage some of that for you. <laughs> I, I think you, you either need a computer system management or if you're going to use paper, I believe that we need some sort of a summary system, something that doesn't involve us combing back through pages upon pages of, of, of medical records. I, I, I think that some sort of high level summary system is very important. Yes. I've just, my mind uh, goes back to when I was a, a young vet and I was uh, afraid to miss anything, uh, miss something. So I was typing the, uh, the history as the, the owner <laughs> told it to me and I would get pages and pages of notes from the conversation and now i try to keep them on a specific <laughs> uh, leading question or a specific uh, problem vomiting well, I, and that's it basically right? well let, let's talk about the records for a second um i think that many of us are misled in our training as to what the point is and you know at least in the states when when we're in veterinary school We were encouraged uh, and penalized if we do not mm. write multiple pages for every patient that we see. Like we, you know, we're we're taught to write every possible differential diagnosis and you know our whole thought process and explain in great detail what we saw, and it's so that we can be evaluated. But I think that that's counterproductive in practice. So I would say that our records they serve uh, different purposes than what we're led to believe early on in our training. Mm. The truth is, for me today, the medical record is a wonderful communication tool with the pet owner. And so I'm not saying you send your entire medical record home with the pet owner, but especially during my physical examinations and especially uh, annual examinations, I do send my medical record home with the pet owner. And I do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, it is more important than we are understood than that we are complete when it comes to pet owners. We need them to understand what we want for them to do and where we're going with them. And we do not have time to explain the basis of medicine to them. You know, they, they have not had that training. We are, we are often not able to explain all the intricacies of diabetes to a pet owner in a very limited amount of time. And so being complete and robust, we're going to end up giving them documents that they will never read. It is they're very pressed for time. So they're not going to read them. We need to present something concisely that educates this client about why we want to do what we want to do or why we did what we did. And it's so that they can um, buy in to where we're going. You know, they can they can come to trust us. They can come to feel like they have some control and some understanding. The other thing is there's two others. The second part is it illuminates the future and it's called foreshadowing. So when I have a pet owner, I may not get to do everything that I want to do today, but I can make my life easier by letting them know what I plan to do in the future so that when they come back, I'm not sharing new ideas with them. I am um, going back to ideas that they have heard before and I may have to remind them, but these are not new ideas. And so think about the times that you've had a pet come in and say the pet is limping and you say, we would like to take x-rays of this pet's leg and the pet owner says, I cannot do that today. And then you say, okay, we will treat, we will treat your pet for pain. If he is still limping on Wednesday, I need you to come back and we will take these x-rays. Hmm. On Wednesday, if the pet is still limping, in my experience, that pet owner will generally come back in and they don't argue about taking x-rays at that time. They knew that this was the plan. They know that when they come back, I am going to want to do x-rays. And they have generally resigned themselves to that course of action. They come back. And so the second thing I like about good records is letting the pet owner know where we are going, what to expect in the future. We might not clean your pet's teeth right now. But I am going to be more effective if I tell you the next time I see you, I expect that we will want to clean your pet's teeth. And so then when you hear that again, you say, oh, my veterinarian has talked to me before about this. It's not a new idea. Mm -hmm. 
And the third thing I think is very important in our records and what we share with pet owners is this. What percentage of the people that you see in your practice are the sole financial decision makers in their household? Very, very few for most of us. Mm. I don't know about you. I don't think that I can go and spend $300 or $400 and not explain to my wife what I spent that money on. I don't get that much in allowance. So I don't yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so, so imagine that we bring a pet owner into the practice and we do senior blood work and we do a heartworm test. We do a lot of heartworm testing here. Um, we do fecal examinations, we do vaccines, and, and we send this client away with $300 bill. At the end of the day, their spouse is going to look at them and say, what did you spend all the money on? Hmm. What did we get for our money? And I think we leave a lot of our people unprepared to defend their decision at home. And I think we need to help them there. I think we need to arm them with uh, with the tools they need to justify the purchase. And if they can do that, then I think they will come back to us and they are more likely to follow our recommendations in the future. Yeah. So those are the things that I look for in a medical record. The last part is the medical record is made so that the next veterinarian can pick up where I left off and get up to speed very quickly, have the important information without reading multiple pages. And so I think a lot of times we lose information by writing too much. It becomes, you know, a, a small bit of driftwood in a sea, mm -hmm. as opposed to if we took all that away and just said, here are the essential things that you need to know. Boom. I, I think we can help each other out. And I think we can make our own appointments more efficient mm -hmm. by writing less. But also writing what's important, right? Exactly. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, let me, that's, that's important to make clear. Yeah, yeah I have the. I have a. Uh, usually, I have a communication problem because I'm, I use uh, a lot of words, and sometimes I have to talk for ten minutes before I know what is what <laughs> what I want to say. Uh, so uh, I do a lot of thinking out loud, and that's not always beneficial when I'm uh, face to face with a client. But they they cannot follow my stream of words until uh, and afterwards. Even though I try to sum it up, they they will have lost my train of thought and they I, don't I, know where I'm going so I can definitely uh, practice being more precise concise on what I want to say I, I find that to be very true and I, I think out loud as well and so one of the skills that I've really had to work on in which I, I try to teach to other doctors uh, young doctors especially that I work with the uh, the strategy of leaving the exam room Uh, to do diagnostics for, for a purpose, but if I can get out of the exam room and collect my thoughts, then I can come back and communicate much more concisely than if I'm standing in front of you, the pet owner, and trying to decide where I want to go, you're more likely to hear me kind of babbling <laughs> as, I, as I get my thoughts straight. And, and this is often overwhelming. It can also be confusing because they don't know exactly know what we're asking them to do. They're getting a lot of information and the important points get lost inside of that, that stream of me trying to get my thoughts in order. Yeah. So, um, I have a couple of questions on, on this and in your course, there's seven steps to the fantastic appointments. We're not going mm -hmm. to get through all the seven of them, seven of them. I can feel now. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, and I'm going to ask you about the history taking next because that's more the, the verbal communication, but, mm -hmm. um, just to be completely cl clear here, what is it that you want us to do? Do you want us to print out or email the, the record to the owner afterwards? Oh, great question. In it, or, or what is it exactly that you will have us do? Oh, it's a very good question. So for me, I very much like the physical examination report. You know, so it's it's not it's not the record, and not necessarily that. There's there's a number of different ways to do this. The way that I like to do it is um, in the in the practice management software, the the computer software that we use. 
I will pull up and, and I will start a new physical examination. And so I will write down the, the subjective, which is the history. Mm-hmm. What, did, what did they come from or come for? What were they trying to accomplish? The, uh, the objective is what did I find on my physical examination? And this is generally generated as a template. And so I can pull up a, a pre-made physical examination that's totally normal for the pet. And it walks through the eyes, the ears, the teeth, you know, the coat, the lymph nodes, your general system, all those things. And then I will change the things that are abnormal. So this is accurate and full in the physical examination. And then my assessment is what we decided to do, what diagnostic tests we did, what we found, what our thought process is. And then the plan is where we go in the future. And I, I can type those. I type those out fairly quickly. I stay concise. I, I hit the points. I make sure I get in the States. Uh, people like to sue each other. And so we always make sure we record the things that we recommend that they choose not to do uh, f- sort of to protect ourselves. And then that is what I will print and, and give to them so that they can go home and say, when they look at their invoice, their bill, they say, Andy charged me $62 for a physical examination. And then you can look at your other sheet and say, he looked at the eyes, the ears, the mouth, you know, the throat, the lymph nodes, the coat, the musculoskeletal system, the heart, the lungs, you know, and, and all those sorts of things. And so you can see what you got for your money when you look at that at that document. But that's what I what I tend to do. It generally tends to be um, t- two to three pages when it's all printed out. But again, I have that system where I can automatically generate a uh, physical examination that's normal and then change the parts that are abnormal on this specific pet mm. to make it accurate. Yeah. So you're also uh, trying to communicate a value that you've been uh, uh, thorough and, and you looked at everything and you you um, made a point to uh, to consider the, the owner's uh, complaint. Exa- well, of, of course, absolutely. The other thing is, You know, um, I don't think that most pet owners understand how much information we gather when we do a physical examination. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they realize how many thoughts pass through our mind, how many things we are looking for, or how many subtle things that we find and evaluate because we don't, we just don't have time to articulate all those things to the pet owner. So yes, I think showing them in written format, I think a lot of times they're rather stunned when you really lay out all the things that we assess in a physical examination. Yes. I, uh, you don't have to be a, a vet for a very long time before you can run through an, an, an animal within like three minutes and, and we've seen what, maybe not all of it, but but still some of the important stuff. Uh, and I, uh, I, early in my career, I thought that was a, a good thing that I could be fast and uh, because... And, uh, The, the 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 practice owner uh, would like me to be fast because then I could get more patient through and sometimes I would try to take the history uh, while examining the pet and then of course I couldn't communicate what I was finding uh, I could just afterwards said I didn't find anything unusual here so don't you worry and they didn't quite buy into that uh, because right. I haven't listened to the complaint and I haven't looked at the animal uh, while they were focused on that was uh, uh, I was good they they were focused on as answering my questions and not focused yes. on uh, what my hands were doing so they can hey. focus on two things at the same time and, and you're exactly right and those two things Soren those are the most valuable things that we do and when you smash them together neither one of them went went as well as it should so when we talk about the history taking really what I'm talking about is hearing the the pet owner and and it's not only listening to them but it's making very sure that they feel like they have been listened to so when we talk about taking the history um i'm trying to accomplish two things number one i i want to know what's going on with the pet i want the history but number two i want you to trust me And you will trust me when you feel that I have listened to you, when you have gotten to tell your story, when I have, you know, when I've made good eye contact with you, you know, uh, you've, and we've all talked to someone before and they say, I'm listening, I'm listening. And they're writing something down and you think (laughs) you are not, you are half listening at best. You know, I want that. That is part of the service that I offer. So 
when they come in, I say, um, I'll start to take the history. And, and one of my favorite questions I'll say, um, tell me about the first time you thought there might be a problem. And that's a beautiful open question that, that gets them to tell the story. And it also makes them put their thoughts into chronologic order. So they don't tend to jump around as much, but I like that question a lot. And so I, I will say, tell me about the first time you thought there might be a problem. And then I will lean forward and I will look them right in the eyes and I will nod my head and um, I will make notes. If you want someone to believe that you're listening to them, there is nothing better, more powerful or impactful you can do than write down what they're saying. And, and that's not a, a gimmick or a trick. That's true. Hmm. And so when we write these things down, it's a way for me to make sure that I am listening because if I am taking notes that I am processing what they're saying. And so they tell me about when they came home and they saw their pet having what they think is a seizure and they walk me through it and I, and I ask them some questions and I take some notes. That is a transfer of trust between the pet owner and me. And everything that I'm doing now is I am building up to the recommendation that I will make in the future, but I want to build all the trust that I can so that when I give my advice, when I say this is what we should do, the pet owner is the most likely to believe in me and follow that advice. And so the first part is that history, and it's very much listening to them. It seems like this would take a lot of time, it really doesn't. There's there's research on the human side of medicine where they have doctors that ask these types of questions. And, and most people will talk for about 40 seconds or so. And and that's it. They they just they will tell you the story. Oh, it's 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 and don't quote me on that exact number, but it, it's about like that. It it is not generally a long time. Most of us, if we talk for 30 or 40 seconds and explain what happened, that's really all that there is to say. Mm -hmm. And so the other point that I make here is to say the time that you spend listening to this person talk, you will make that time back, Soren, when you make your recommendation. And they, they're less likely to argue with you. You know, they, they trust you. They're, 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 less, um, they're less likely to ask more questions or, or need to be convinced. And so I'm a big believer that ultimately we come out ahead on time if we make this investment, if we don't make this investment to make them feel heard, I feel like we spend much more time later on trying to get them to follow our advice. And so for me, and I can't prove that, but that's how I, how I tend to rationalize it. And I do think that that's how the, the math works out. Yeah. So, that, so that's the part is, is taking that history and asking, answering those questions. And then the next part is when we do the physical examination, we really need to talk through everything that we're doing because I want those people to see the value in this physical examination. I want them to believe this is worth their money and their time. And as you said before, you know, the truth is sort of after we've done this for a year or two, you could tell me all about the last movie that you saw while you do a physical examination and you would not miss anything. But if you do that, the pet owner does not value the physical examination that you've done. They they do not realize all the information you're taking in as you essentially massage their pet. Um, they 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 just don't know it. And so again, me talking through the physical examination is more about building trust in the pet owner than it is me helping myself get the diagnosis. I could get the diagnosis faster if I didn't say anything, just did my physical examination, asked them a bunch of yes or no questions, and then I said, aha, here is the answer. And a lot of us want to do that for the reasons that we talked about before. We are very problem-oriented people. So we want to say, aha, here is the problem. Yeah. You need to do this. And the problem is when we say you need to do this, if we have not taken that time to build that trust, that is where the conversation ends because the pet owner doesn't believe our answer. It's not our, I, 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 again, I think we're taught in our training, you need to get the right answer. That is what matters. Nothing matters more than that. But I don't believe that, Soren. I believe you need to ask the right question. When you ask the right question, 
the pet owner will realize the right answer. And then it will be his answer or her answer. And they will own that answer. And then they will be willing to do what is necessary to solve the problem that they know and understand that they have. Mm. And that's where the magic in the exam room happens. So uh, the good communication part here is way more than just open-ended questions, right? It's, of course, also listening to the answers and not interrupting with a follow-up question before they have talked the whole way through and not doing the physical examination while you're trying to have a conversation and not trying to type something at the computer and read through the history <laughs> on the computer while listening. To, you have to do uh, one thing at a time and s- signalizing, how's that word in English? You have to show the, the owner that you you actually listen with your body yes. language and, and with you shutting up. It, it, it's, it's true. Getting the right medical diagnosis is, is important, but you have to create that experience for the owner so that when you give them the diagnosis, they will go forward with it. And I tell people this example, I say, um, I don't want to talk to you about your dog Oscar's osteoarthritis. I don't want to talk to you about osteoarthritis. I want to talk to you about how Oscar sits at the bottom of the stairs and cries when your children go upstairs to play because that is what you care about. And so let's talk to you about getting Oscar back up those stairs. Let's talk about um, if we can't regain that mobility, let's talk about at least protecting the mobility that he has so he can play with the children as long as possible. But we as veterinarians, we want to talk about osteoarthritis Yes. But that is not what the pet owner cares about. But isn't that the same thing? It's not the same thing at all. It's not the same thing at all. Aha. Because talking about the way that Oscar plays with the children is a motivator for me. It's it's about why the pet owner comes to us. And that why is so important. I will give you an example. Um, years ago... I, uh, I had a bad habit. I'll be very honest. I had a bad habit of, um, picking up my, my cell phone when I would drive my car. And so I would drive my car and I'd come to a stoplight and I would get some tweets on Twitter, you know, or I would get texts and I would look at my phone and things like that. And my wife said to me, she said, you have got to stop that. And I said, Oh, it's not a big problem. And she said, Andy, it is against the law now. You can get a ticket. The police will give you a, a, a ticket if they catch you doing that. And Soren, that that was not a big motivator for me. Mm-hmm. The idea that I might get a ticket, it did. I said, oh, they'll never, they'll never stop me for this. It's not a big deal. Like, really? My wife is a rule follower. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that this was against the rules was all that she needed to hear. But that did not motivate me. It just didn't. And then one day she became frustrated and I looked at my phone when we were at a stop sign and I I kept glancing down and waiting for a text message and my wife got angry and she said, listen, (laughs) you're going to get in an accident and you're going to get killed and then your children will not have a father because you did this stupid thing. And Soren, that made a big impact on me. I thought, oh my gosh, she is right. It's one thing for me to get a ticket. That's not very motivating for me. But the idea of my children not having a father because I did this stupid behavior, that is very motivating for me. And pet owners are the same way. It was the same in that my wife kept saying, you have to stop this behavior. But the reason that she gave me, it mattered. And our pet owners are the same way. When I say, you... You should clean your pet's teeth because his breath smells bad. Mm -hmm. That is not the same as saying your pet is getting dental disease and I worry about him having pain when he eats. You know, Mm -hmm. those are, those are different things. Um, and they can both be true. You could have terrible breath. I'm worried about your pet's lifespan being shortened because of his dental disease. I'm worried about him not living as long as he can. 
that may be different, a different motivator than his breath smells bad and it's offensive. <laughs> but it, I need to know what you care about so that I can talk to you in a way that will make you do what's right for your pet. Yeah. Um, I have a, a ton of questions on that, but uh, the one okay. That, <laughs> I don't even know where to start, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I but, take that as a good thing. That's that's uh, a good. Thing. We. Uh, How do you think today? My, if think my audience, uh, when uh, they write me and they they ask me what to, uh, uh, I ask them what to to do podcasts about, and one of the things they they mention is actually this very thing that uh, we are standing in front of a, an animal that needs some x-rays for the osteoarthritis or they, it yes. needs to do uh, to have some dental work done because it's uh, it, it's not it, it's uh, completely covered in bacteria uh, and we as professionals uh, are standing there and we're feeling feeling the the animal's pain and we, we I'm uh, put in this world to help this poor animal and I cannot <laughs> communicate this to the owner in a way that they will buy into. So that's okay. a big frustration with my audience it would, uh, in my practice as well. So we know what's best for the animal and probably the owner knows as well, but we are not able to find each other and we're not able to communicate what's important here. Right. So there's, uh, so that is, that is the frustration of veterinary medicine. Uh, there, there are two parts to what we do. Um, there are two parts to what we do. In that situation, you'll be successful if you can, number one, build the trust with the pet owner to where they trust you. And then number two, you have got to talk to them about what they care about, right? You have to, you have to find their priority. Okay. So, um, so let's let's let me let me flip them around, and I'll tell you this. Um, I'll, I'll give you these two two things to think about as we sort of wrap up today. But but let me give you these one. Yeah. Okay. Um, when a, so I'm in South Carolina. We have a lot of fleas, lots of fleas, and I will see a poor dog, and the dog will have fleas, and I think about that dog, and I think this poor dog is being eaten alive by these parasites. You know, these little bugs are running around him and literally eating him. They're taking bites of him and they're drinking his blood. Isn't that horrible, right? That needs to stop. But, Soren, I also know that that is not what pet owners think, okay? Um, do, you, do, you guys, do you see a lot of fleas in your practice? Yeah. Okay. Um, who are the most motivated pet owners to get rid of fleas? What is going on? That they're, and they're, they will knock you to the ground and take the medicine out of your hand. Why? What is going on? Yeah, um, they're keeping the owner awake at night ah, because ah. they're itching and scratching. And they're That's always it. in the bed. And uh, the owner has red spots up on the arms and the legs. That's it. That's that's a hundred percent it. Soren is is they're stay so they're staying awake at night. Like that, those are the, in my experience, those are the most motivated people. Other people are getting bites themselves. Other people have infestations in their house. Do not talk to them about their pet being eaten alive. Even though that motivates you and me and we think of it, oh my gosh, this poor pet. Talk to them about getting sleep at night and they will do what you say because that's what they need. That's where their pain is. And with everything that we talk about, there is pain in that the pet owner perceives part of our job. And this is where the history comes in. It's so important. If we ask the right questions, remember I said, it's not about getting the right answer. I trust that you will get the diagnosis. I trust you will get the right answer, but the game is played in asking the right question. So the owner says to you, gosh, I haven't slept in three days. Then I let's talk about fixing this problem immediately. So you can sleep tonight Gosh, won't it be great to lay your head on that pillow tonight and sleep like a log? That's the motivator for the owner, mm -hmm. you know? And so it really is about asking those questions. And, and what I'm looking for when they answer is, what is your relationship to this pet? 
What are you worried about? What do you care about? And then I want to talk to you about that. The the person who has the, um, they have young kids and they have an overweight golden retriever and they say, oh, this dog just belongs to those children. I mean, they are so lucky to have this dog. I say, aha, the relationship of that dog to your children is what you care about. That dog's value in your eyes is about the best friend relationship with your son or daughter. And so when I talk to you about obesity, I'm going to talk to you about how an overweight pet lives on average two years less than an ideal sized golden retriever. And we know that from, uh, from the research that's done. But I'm going to talk to you about how I want your son or daughter to have the longest life best friend they can possibly have. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to talk about those things and try to get into their head of what they care about. I'll give you, I'll give you one last example uh, on, on finding out what they care about. I had a pet one time, and it was a dog that was in uh, chronic renal failure. And the dog was just getting worse and worse, and the BUN and the creatinine were going up, and the, uh, you know, the dog was becoming anemic and you know, wouldn't eat anything and, and terrible weight loss. And so when this, this dog was suffering at, at the end. You know, this dog was suffering. And I kept talking to this woman, and I was like, you know, I would show her the blood work and I would show her the values going up. And, and, and I kept saying, you know, um, surely he's not acting normal at home. And she goes, well, he's better at home. And I'm looking at this poor dog who hasn't eaten in weeks. And he, you know, it's, it's terrible. It's tearing my heart out. I was so frustrated. And finally she's in there and I'm talking to her again. And I see it in her face that she's going to take this dog and she's going to leave. And I feel myself getting very angry. I, and I don't think she saw that, but I, but I started to get angry. And I realized this is not helpful. This is not productive. This is not going the way I want it to go. And so I stopped. And I just said to her, you seem to have some concerns about putting your dog to sleep. Can you tell me what they are? And she said, well, this was my son's dog. And he died in a car accident two years ago. And this dog is what I have to remember him by. Oh, yeah. And you've, you've probably seen, you've seen cases I've, like that. Yeah. It may be, it, it may be the mother that died. I mean, I know that that's very, very sad, but guys, isn't that a different conversation? It doesn't change the fact that this dog is dying is, you know, is in renal failure that that this dog is suffering regardless of our treatment. And so I said to her, okay, if your son was here, what would he want to do? And she said, well, he would not want the dog to suffer. And so we put the dog to sleep. Hmm. And that is the point that I make where I say, it's not the same thing, you know, the, the way that we say it matters so much. I thought that this woman didn't understand what was happening with her dog. And I talked to her about her dog and the disease. And all of that was true and all of it was accurate. But she didn't want to talk about her dog. She needed to talk about what the dog meant to her and the dog connecting her to her son. And when we could talk about that connection with her son, and I, I that's a dangerous conversation, I know, and I, I, don't, I don't look forward to these, but as soon as we talked about what she cared about, everything changed. And suddenly we can put this dog who needs to be put to sleep, to sleep. Mm. And so asking the right questions to figure out what their priorities are or what they care about. That's number one. Number two is the trust part. And, I, and I, let me just lay this out. And because this is, this, is, this is the core of everything that I do and everything that I believe about being a doctor, okay? So I believe um, that we, Sora and you and me, we play a game for our living, okay? It's called the trust game. And here's how it works. Okay. Every moment 
that you are talking to a pet owner, actually every moment they're in your practice, even from walking up to it, one of two things is happening. You are gaining trust or you are losing trust. And so when you stand in that exam room and the person walks in and she has a Boston Terrier and you say, ah, you have a Boston Terrier. I have three Boston Terriers. I love Boston Terriers. That's my favorite breed. And of course, that's, that has to be true for you to say it. Um, <laughs> don't, don't say it if it's not true. But, uh, but as soon as I say that, think of it like, a, like a, an odometer in a car. You know, it's, it's rolling up. My score is going up. She's going, wow, he has this thing in common with me. He loves Boston Terriers and I love Boston Terriers. And he must know a lot about Boston Terriers. And I'm, I'm gaining this trust. And then they have their daughter with them. And you say, I have a daughter. That's a similar age. She thinks, oh, he's a parent, just like I'm a parent and we have this shared experience and you're gaining this trust and she looks around your exam room and, and it's and it's it's beautiful and everything is arranged as it should be. It's very inviting and she goes, wow, this looks like a wonderful facility. And, and the person who took her in at the front desk smiled at her when she came in. All of those things are making the trust go up. But then imagine you know, that she walks in and the person at the front desk is looking at her phone and, and doesn't look up to say hello and... And you, she thinks, oh, this person doesn't seem excited for me to be here. And, and then they come into the exam room and it smells like cat pee or, or it's, it's dirty. And she goes, oh, no. And, and the trust game is just going down. And you walk in and go, oh, look at look at that Boston Terrier. What a wonderful little boy. And she goes, it's a girl. Mm. And you go, oh, no. You know, and the trust score just goes down. Pow, 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 pow. So so that's that's how the basis of the game works is when we when we connect with these people, we gain trust. Our trust score goes up. And when we do things that shake their trust, or we don't know things, or we forget things, or we seem unorganized, or our, our clinic is, is dirty, or whatever, it goes down. Now, here's where the game happens. I believe that every time you ask a pet owner to do something, you burn trust. It, it burns. It's gone. Okay? The bigger the thing you ask, the more trust you, you, you burn. So, so if you're thinking about trust as a number, it drops. Okay. If you burn that trust and you're still on the positive, the pet owner will do what you ask them to do. And if you burn that trust and you go into the negative, they will not do mm. what you ask them to do. You know, the clients that you have who have come to you for 10 years and whatever you say, this is what we need to do. They will do that thing. Mm. You know, those people. Yeah. Do you know why they will do that? Because I have a lot of uh, trust to score with them. So Yes. You have been a good steward of their trust. You have played this game for 10 years and you have this huge surplus, this huge trust number. And when you ask them to do things, you're still burning that trust, but you have built so much that it, it's fine. They're going to say yes. That is the game that we play. And some people come in and they do not trust veterinarians. And we already have a big negative score that has nothing to do with you. But we're going to have to build our way back up and out of that hole. And so now you can even see why I organize things the way that I do. You can see why I sit and I ask them the history questions and I, I listen to them, right? Or I make notes or I ask follow-up questions so they, they, they feel very heard. And I explain to them what I'm doing in the physical examination. All of these things are me building trust. And only at the end am I going to say, okay, this is a wonderful pet. Thank you for bringing him in today. Uh, I can tell how much you care about him. He's fantastic. There are two things I need to talk to you about. And you probably know what they are. The first is his weight and the second is his teeth. Come and let's have a, let's have a look in his mouth together. Yeah. Right? But I put that at the end because I've built this trust all the way up. You know what I mean? And now when I say, let's look at his teeth, we need to get his, his teeth cleaned. Now I'm going to burn that trust down. And when I talk to them about getting the teeth cleaned, I'm going to use what I know about them to present this course of action in the most effective way, in the one that they will see the most value in. And that will be my best shot for getting them to do what I want them to do. Right. Well, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that might also be why you have that as number one in your seven fantastic steps to the uh, seven steps to the fantastic appointment. 
mm -hmm. because it's so important for the to the whole rest of the appointment is that it it, it really is i mean i just you know uh, the rest of the appointment is about controlling time about running good systems and not forgetting things being efficient and setting yourself up for success in the future but that building trust and figuring out what the pet owner that specific pet owner values those are the only two things that really matter yeah so i think we might have touched on three and not in order maybe four of these <laughs> things so um where will people go if they would like to know more about you read some of your writing look up uh, what the course is all about and and what else is important Sure. Um, DrAndyRourke.com, so D-R-A-N-D-Y-R-O-A-R-K.com is the website, and you can find out the the course there. It's called Seven Steps to Fantastic Appointments. I made it with Dr. Dave Nichol. And the other thing is I, I have a podcast. It's called Uncharted Veterinary Podcast, and it's um, it's all it's all management. So it's all management and communication. Um, you can find that podcast, and uh, it comes out every week. Husk, at du kan finde links og noter til dagens afsnit på hjemmesiden på sivp.dk-114. Det her det er afsnit nummer 114, så det er så smart indrettet, at dem finder du altså på sivp.dk-114. I bunden af artiklen derovre kan du også blive tilmeldt nyhedsbrevet. Og det er altså det her nyhedsbrev, hvor jeg sender fagligt relevant indhold. Der er nogle pdf-ark til blandt andet endokrine lidelser og noget med hudsygdom og lidt forskelligt om karriere. Der er mange forskellige gode ting i den, det nyhedsbrev, som jeg sender ud der. Det er helt gratis at modtage. Og hvis ikke det er noget for dig, så kan du med et enkelt klik melde dig fra igen, men jeg vil klart anbefale dig at tage et klik på det nederst i artiklen på sivp.dk-114. Næste gang skal vi også snakke om noget meget praksisrelevant, men et helt andet emne. Der graver vi os nemlig ned i blodprøver og hvordan vi ligesom kommer lidt bedre ind på livet af dem, men det tager vi på søndag. Vi høres ved. Hej.